there are risks to funding for the building of affordable homes, um, which of course vital in London um, in order to be able to keep key workers working here and we need key workers working here as well of course for the quality of people's lives and risks to local government funding allocation and for some London boroughs those risks might be feeling more acute today after we saw yesterday's census data. Um, we did a tweet thread on the census data yesterday we will be writing much more about it but definitely something that we need to be thinking about in the context of all of these levelling up challenges. And of course, um, we are all extremely worried about funding for Transport for London. Um, I spoke to a journalist last week who told me helpfully that this was the fifth short-term um, TFL funding de deal. I slightly lost count. We were like, have we put out a statement about this one? There seems to be an awful lot of them. We, we need to keep on talking about this stuff. Um, we are waiting until the 13th of July to see what happens. Um, so once again, it's becoming very, very difficult to plan. Um, I think it's worth saying it, it's sort of bad luck. It's, it's been going on for such a long time now that it started to feel inevitable that we have this fight between TFL and the government. It's terribly bad luck that the pandemic, with its massive drops in passenger numbers, which you know it's worth reminding, those happened because passengers were told to stay at home. They didn't happen because people were suddenly like, oh, you know what, I'm going to sit in the garden, um, which I think would sometimes be easy to think from what the government say. They happened because Londoners were doing what they were told. Um, happened to come at a time but there was rising anti-government sentiment in London. We would have been in a very different position, I think, had we had a different government and a different relationship between local, central and regional governments at the time the pandemic hit. Um, but we are where we are. It's a dangerous moment, I think. Um, so this is, this is worrying. It's worrying for the most vulnerable Londoners. Um, again, small stuff but important. Bus fares went up this year more than tube fares. That matters because it's buses that lower income Londoners rely on. And buses are also subsidised by tube fares. I, for years, I assumed that the reason that buses in London are cheap is because they're subsidised by the taxpayer. They're not. They're subsidised by people who take relatively expensive tubes. So drops to tube passenger use risk bus services, even if those bus services themselves are not losing passengers. Um, so bad news for the most vulnerable Londoners. But of course, also potentially bad news for the whole country, which is why businesses are very bothered about this stuff. They're bothered about being able to get people to their offices. They're bothered about being able to get visitors in. They're bothered about being able to get tourists in. Um, and of course, that matters to the whole country because London's businesses and London's wealthy people, and of course, there are some very wealthy people as well as some people who are really struggling, pay quite a lot of tax. And London is, of course, a net contributor, despite all of this need that I've talked about, despite the fact that those... Um, a quarter of those NDC areas were in London, um, is a net contributor to the country. We pay more in tax than we get back in public services. So damaging productivity in London um, would be dangerous, to say the least. And I guess it's worth saying at this point that in many cases, our competitors for that international business investment are not Manchester and Birmingham. Um, they're Paris and Singapore. So this is about how we can help um, London to contribute better to the whole country. Um, and of course, we know um, that businesses in London have supply chains and connections that reach out all over the place. Um, we all know that trains are made in lots of places for TFL, and they're mostly not made in London, buses likewise, and so on. Um, the challenge we have, of course, is that there are an awful lot of people in the country, possibly in this room and certainly in the government, who are getting a little bit sick of hearing about London's needs. Um, and have been told many, many times that four in 10 London children live in poverty. Um, and there are also a lot of people who get a little bit sick, and we hear this quite a lot at Centre for London. Will you please stop telling us where trains are manufactured? We know where the trains are manufactured. Um, it's a difficult narrative to get right, and it's a difficult narrative to get right with the right level of sharing our successes, talking about our needs, and speaking with due humility about the fact that London can, must, and indeed does, learn a lot from other places, both in the UK and overseas. Um, so of course we need to find out new and better ways of talking about these things and this is a really it's a serious and important challenge i think um and something that we at center for london are looking forward to um and aware is going to be difficult um over the summer we're working with our really lovely research partners um samantha comrades and toynbee hall um to talk to people inside and outside london um, about what they think um such an important piece of work i think and such such a challenging one and an interesting one um how do we tell this story in a better way? How do we 
talk about London um, in a way that doesn't um, frankly get people's backs up, which is something we seem to have managed to get wrong quite a lot in the past. Um, and then in the autumn, we're going to be putting it together, our second um, phase two report um, for this um, Centre for London Leveling Up project, which is going to look in much more detail, having looked in phase one at London's needs. Um, we're going to look in much more detail at London's contribution, at London's relationship to the rest of the UK, and of course, how we talk about it. We're very much looking forward to talking to you more about this. Uh, we will be working away during the summer. We've got another event coming up in September, and then that second report coming out in the autumn, and much more work on narrative as well. Um, but for now, I am just about to hand back to um, Andy and Linda for what promises to be an absolutely fascinating discussion today. Um, just before I do that, um, for people who are watching us online, we're just going to shift the camera um, so it points to the podium um, rather than um, to the to me standing up here. Um, so Andy and Linda, if you'd like to come up, I will then um, just keep on talking for a few more minutes so, uh, um, so our lovely audience at home don't miss the start of Andy and Linda's discussion. Um, there were lots of helpful suggestions from my colleague yesterday about what I could do to fill this time. Um, it was suggested that I could sing um, to the people who were with me at the Dolish Junior School um, production of The Sound of Music in about 1997. I'm terribly, terribly sorry. I won't do it again. Um, it was suggested that I could dance, um, which also seems like it would be a fairly bad idea. Somebody suggested that I could do leveling up through the medium of interpretive dance, which I feel would involve lots of kind of 1970s disco moves with arms going up and down. Um, but fortunately, Bob has now given me two hands up, so I will spare you leveling up through the means of interpretive dance. Um, and instead, it's my absolute pleasure and privilege to hand over to Andy Haldane and Linda Yu. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. A, a show of hands if you want to see Claire's interpretive dance. <laughs> <coughs> Um, just to add my welcome uh, to you all, um, I'm Linda Yu, and it is a real pleasure uh, to be able to moderate this conversation with Andy Haldane. And um, I'm going to uh, introduce him and then go through the running order, um, and then we'll just um, kick off. But firstly, can I say thank you to the Centre of London for London, who always do incredibly important um, events, I can see uh, right here. And, um, which I always thoroughly enjoy in such a, an important um, time uh, for this capital city. And of course, thanks to, uh, to Queen's for giving <coughs> us this fantastic venue. So uh, with that, let me uh, introduce um, Andy. So people always say this, oh, he needs no introduction, but he actually doesn't. <laughs> I think all of you online and here uh, know of the impact that Andy Alfadane has had on economics. He is. Andy is probably hands down one of the most creative economists that um, I have. Before you start thinking the bar is low, <laughs> <laughs> economics is a subject which is so heavily laden sometimes with technical detail, with mathematics. <clears throat> it's extremely rare to get somebody who is just a thinker who masters those things and then comes up with ideas and comes up with things that make you pause. And, you know, I think um, Andy's. Uh, reputation here is very well deserved. So, um, unsurprisingly, he holds a number of professorships. He's a visiting professor here at Keynes. His office is about five minutes away. He also holds honorary professorships at Nottingham and Manchester universities, and he's a visiting fellow at Nuffield College. And, and on top of that, he actually has a day job. He's the CEO of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, and before that, he was chief economist at the Bank of England and a member of the MPC. And of course, we're here to talk about the work that he's been doing on leveling up. And if you feel exhausted, as I have, just relaying all of that, you, <laughs> you know, he, has, um, he is super plural, and I think we're all the better for it. So with that, um, let me um, remind the audience at home that you too uh, can ask questions. Um, so we're going to be in conversation uh, for about 30 minutes, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. for. Those of you who are um, in the room, uh, just, you know, just wave <laughs> and a microphone will find you. If you're online watching uh, by the live stream, um, you can use the code hashtag 3758095. So that's hashtag 3758905 
to access uh, Slido. And I will put your question to Andy as well. So, um, Andy, let me just kick off and just, just ask you about um, the leveling up uh, work um, that you've been doing. And since the report has come out, just talk us through sort of what's happened. What are some of the actions that have already um, taken place or you hope soon will take place? Well, Linda, thank you. I think that's a super warm introduction as well. Um, I feel my work is done, actually. Um, and very nice to see you all. Uh, and thank you to the Centre for London for existing, actually. This is a topic that really needs work, needs research, needs analysis, needs policy thinking, needs a nudge. Um, politicians need a nudge, uh, including especially perhaps from think tanks and academics. And I hope the centre can provide just that nudge that we'll need to make good on an agenda that to have any hope of succeeding, we'll need to stretch out as far as the eye can see. We're talking about a decadal plan at best to make good uh, on this. And in keeping government's feet to the flame, successive government's feet to the flame, on this, we really need uh, all parts of society, academia, think tank land, civil society, business and beyond, talking the language uh, and making it happen on the ground. So to your question, uh, Linda, what has happened so far? <laughs> Um, I'm going to assume that everyone has read the 375 pages. It was there as pre-reading in your pack. Um, uh, what's happened since then? Um, well, two or three things I can point to. Um, on the understanding, this is going to be a long haul. Where's the being concrete progress so far? I think the place where it was initially easiest to begin to make some headway was when it came... Uh, to the, the devolution, the decentralization of more powers to more places. That was a central feature of the white paper that by 2030, any part of the UK that wanted a devolution deal could have one. Uh, but the real kicker was in the second part of that mission, which is that uh, that devolved place could have powers at or approaching London levels by 2030. That is quite a big ask, actually. Um, you know, eight years is a short period of time when it comes to root and branch reform of local government, as many in this room will know. That's an ambitious objective. So cracking on with it was really important. And I think some cracking on has begun, uh, including through the so-called uh, two trailblazer deals in uh, Greater Manchester and in the West Midlands. That's the, the two Andes. Actually, the two Andes are coming in to the third Andes place next <laughs> Tuesday. If any of you want to come along and hear what they've got to say uh, about All Matters Devo. So um, the deepening of existing deals, the widening of deals, uh, whether mayoral uh, or county deals, that is now starting to bear fruit. Uh, I would hope that by the end of the summer, there will be more to report on that front, uh, Linda. The machinery of government uh, is itself going through a bit of a rewiring. It absolutely needed to, because truth be told, spatial considerations, geographic considerations, leveling up considerations were not front and center in the deliberations of each and every Whitehall department. Um, now, including through a weekly uh, cabinet committee, uh, that is now beginning to change. That whatever policy is brought forward uh, before that's introduced, that is put through <coughs> the leveling up filter, if you like. The question is asked, is this helping contribute to this um, to this greater good, however well intended uh, it is. When I travel around the country, I was up in um, Bradford uh, last Friday, uh, I was up in Manchester the week before that. You speak to local leaders, as I did, mayors or non-mayors, and they will tell you that they are cracking on too. And for me, in a way, Linda, that will be the best diagnostic of all. Mm. Leveling up will fail if the question is, you know, 
waiting for the next move from central government. No. That's what failure feels like. Success feels like local people, local leaders, government, business, academia, civil society, cracking on. And my sense in a number of places is that they are cracking on and not waiting, which is just the right thing. I, I think that's absolutely um, spot on. I think oftentimes, you know, what is it that um, Milton Friedman said? Never judge a policy by its intentions, um, but judge it by its outcomes. And the outcomes never come because you're told from the top down, <laughs> this is the outcome. It has to come from you know, collaboration in the grassroots and people know their communities and what they actually need, um, which is going to take me to, you're going to guess the next question. It <laughs> takes money. <laughs> you know, it's great to have the intention, the motivation. We know it's important. So um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts about fiscal devolution. Yeah. Yeah, so um, on the money, plainly um, leveling up will not levitate. It will require uh, a degree of um, financing. Um, what gives me um, some degree of comfort, some degree of comfort on that front, Linda? A few things. One, um, the missions that we set out, 12 missions, uh, are long-term in their orientation, right? So this is successor governments, successor spending reviews. That's really important. Uh, the government's spending quite a lot at the moment, as it turns out. Uh, and budgets are tight for governments, for businesses, for households. Uh, stretching this out, having this as a long-term plan can help smooth the burden. The language sometimes used by economists is you know, tax smoothing or spending smoothing. Uh, point one, uh, time can help. Uh, secondly, um, it's not all about public money. Truth be told, um, there are huge pools of private capital out there. There's 300 billion pounds in local government pension schemes. There's three trillion pounds in UK pension funds. A very, very small fraction of which currently is given over to local projects to making good on leveling up. Uh, that strikes me as peculiar. At two levels, one, it'd be great for the places to be the beneficiary of more of this largesse, and two, it'd be good for the investors as well. So finding means of um, unlocking more of those private sector monies, either domestic or international, I think is a, a crucial part of making good on this. In fact, I'd go further and say that our conception of the role of public monies in leveling up needs to change. This is really about asking what amount of seed corn, keyword, seed corn, catalytic financing, is needed by government to crowd in those private monies I mentioned uh, earlier on. If you look at the examples internationally of successful leveling up, East Germany possibly notwithstanding, that the heavy lifting has been done as much or more from the crowding in of private money, creating a buzz about a place, a magnetic attraction about a place. And that will be true in the UK um, as well. Final point, Linda, um, which is where your question was focused, which is fiscal devo. Um, we made, I think, with the devolution mission, uh, a great step forward. If that mission was made good on, that would be the biggest decentralization of powers in the UK for a century, I think. But do I think that goes far enough? No, I do not. I think even making good on that mission by 2030 would leave us with half a loaf when it came to devolution and decentralization. Uh, that's true of powers to spend, but it's true to an even greater extent of powers to tax, which is to raise money. That is a plank of the Devo debate that until very recently uh, was relatively barren. I think that needs to change. I think that needs to change here in London. I think that needs to change around the country so that local leaders have both a left and a right hand, both spend and taxation powers when they're going about their business of making their place. Mm.
That sounds crucially important. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask for a probability of that happening. <laughs> um, I could either you can either give me a probability of that happening or a time frame, but you don't have yeah, to yeah. give both. Never give both. That's right. <laughs> right. The iron law of forecasting: never give both. <laughs> Um, I think it will happen. Uh, I'm much more confident on it happening than I am uh, in providing a date as to when it will happen, <laughs> uh, which is very convenient, uh, scarred by um, many forecasts <laughs> having gone not entirely according to plan um, over the last 30 years. Although the last 12 months have gone pretty well, actually, the forecasting front, um, for me personally. <laughs> um, so I, I think it will, um, because I think right now, on all matters of devolution, we're in a very unstable equilibrium, which is to say we've granted the powers to spend to mayors. We are expanding those powers, and we're expanding the number of places that will have those powers. Uh, the reason that's an unstable equilibrium is because it sets up um, a very interesting dynamic, which is if you are an Andy, an Andy S, an Andy B, not an Andy H, you can say, thanks very much for the billion for the railway station, but how about the billion for the airport, right? Um, you know, the ask always comes. Uh, and the larger number of mayors and the larger their range of powers, the bigger the asks will come. And that's why, one of the reasons they're all so popular is if you're doing all, this, all the spending and all the taxing, it's easy to be quite popular, you know. Um, so I think, ultimately, there will need to be, to line up the incentives, the taxation part of the equation will need to come on stream. I don't know exactly when, and of course, old habits do, high, uh, do die hard uh, within the great machine. With the two great machines of Whitehall and Westminster, you know, there's a reluctance to let go. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but I think the letting go, in a way, would be the very thing that re-empowers Whitehall and Westminster. Lessons from um, other countries certainly suggest Just that, that. Yeah, that if you have um, the local ability to both spend and tax, the incentives are better aligned, yeah. and also it's better tailored. Yeah. You know, and politically, it's actually easier for the center to say, "Oh, actually, that's a dev that's a that was devo devo." This is a very cool term to talk about devolution. <laughs> that's a local power. You know, so go to the go to your local leaders. I hadn't, also hadn't realized that to do leveling up, you need to be called Andy. <laughs> Very important. In the, in the interest of diversity, everyone is an Andy. <laughs> um, I want to focus on London um, for a moment. Um, has London been incorporated? Is it somewhat overlooked? Where does it sit within the leveling up agenda for government? So on that, Linda, um, I think a degree of mayor culpa here, actually. Um, so I, I hope, for those of you who have wedded through all those pages, but we did do a fair job, a good job, of setting out the sort of map that Claire just demonstrated, actually, and making clear this was absolutely not an agenda of leveling down. This was absolutely not an agenda of north versus south. This was absolutely not an agenda of city versus town. That the problems of UK PLC were very rich and hypergranular, hyperlocal, actually. And that map brings it out the point absolutely beautifully. But even within incredibly small geographic zones, you have extreme affluence and extreme deprivation sitting right next. And that is true in every city across the UK, as, as you all know. So to think you can say it's about what's happening in this region versus that region or this city versus that region is nonsense. It does not fit the map. Uh, and that does mean very locally, hyper-locally tailored policies in the way that Claire mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, and as Claire also set out um, very elegantly and, and, and compellingly, you know, there, is, there are more people in poverty in London than anywhere else in the UK. Uh, your child poverty numbers are startling. Um, now, the mayor culpa part is that, although that was in the white paper, I think that was not what was sometimes conveyed and communicated as effectively mm. as it could have been. Mm. And I take some responsibility for that. Not all of it, but some of it. Uh, we should have gone even further in making clear this was not uh, an anti-London agenda, that what we were talking about in levelling up was every bit as much about London. And for two distinct reasons. Mm. One I've mentioned, 
which is there are some real pockets that need leveling up in London. But the second, which I think today's report also makes this point clear, is for even the places that are doing well, uh, there are problems of overpriced and overcongested housing, of overpriced and overcongested transport, uh, pollution, absence of green space. I mean, there's a reason, there's a reason why, despite being by a country mile, the top of the pay and productivity league table, London's also bottom of the happiness and well-being league table. That speaks to that broader spectrum of factors. And indeed, those were among the reasons why we, we gave well-being, alongside pay and productivity, a position of equal prominence when it came to what does good levelling up look like. It's as every bit as much about levelling up well-being and indeed tackling poverty and deprivation in London as it is doing that anywhere else around the country. Mm. Just on that messaging point, um, because obviously uh, London is, you know, it is an example of the success of agglomeration. It generates a lot of tax revenues. The, you know, the redistribution is away from London towards, yep. towards other regions. So, you know, if you were to, um, there's, something, uh, there's something that businesses do, which is called the press release first. So you write the press release before you do the product so that you know what it is that, it, that you're actually doing. If you were to write the press release, Andy, <laughs> you know, for why people should think, actually, if London does well, um, then it's really good for the rest of the country. And it's not at all detrimental to leveling up. Um, you yeah. know, what, what would it read like? Yeah. Well, I think this is, um, and again, I hope we made these points um, maybe not as clearly as comp and compellingly as we, as, as we, as we sh could and should have done, that um, this really, levelling up is really not a redistributional agenda. That's not what it's about. It's not about taking, re-slicing the pie in a way that London has a bit less mm -hmm. and everyone else has a bit more. This is all about expanding of the pie. Um, uh, whether you call that in nerdy terms, uh, Pareto efficiency, uh, or in less nerdy terms, kind of cakeism. Uh, it's the same sort of idea, really, which is uh, there is potential to be a huge amounts of potential to be locked in people and in place mm. in every part of the UK, including uh, in London. Mm. And the leveling up agenda is about unlocking that potential in people and in place and thereby expanding the pie which means there's more for everyone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, from my very earliest conversations uh, with the Prime Minister, you know, he was absolutely clear that is what this was about. Mm -hmm. um, which you'd expect, of course, from a former London mayor, it'd be a bit strange for him not to be saying uh, those things. But I think it's absolutely true. And we tried even, um, you know, with a, de a degree of artistic license, um, to put some numbers to how big, how much bigger the pie might be if we make good on that. And those numbers are chunky, mm -hmm. you know, uh, especially at a time when balance sheets are stretched and growth is stalling. Um, we can't, frankly, afford not to unlock more of the potential in people and places. When I hear right now people talking about we need a new national economic plan for the UK in the face of the cost of living crisis, and my response to that is, we've got one. Um, leveling up is a national economic plan, but led locally rather than centrally. If we put that into overdrive, we absolutely could, you know, rekindle growth in people and in places at scale and at speed. And that's what I think we should do. Mm. No, that's really interesting. I mean, the, if the pie gets bigger, your relative position within the pie um, shouldn't be as much a concern. It's about absolute improvements in well-being and in economy. So, so the argument is it's a Pareto improvement, which um, for those of you who, <laughs> who are thinking, I think that means it's a good thing. <laughs> it means that you know, everyone is just getting better off. It's just that some, because they're coming from farther behind, is actually they're getting better off um, to a greater extent, but we want that. We want people more deprived areas to be much better off, you know, than people like me and Andy. Um, 
not making any judgments about your circumstances. But, no, no, you know, sure. <laughs> now a chance you work, just so you know. Um, yeah. um, we, I'm going to open it up to questions in just a few moments. I do want to remind the online audience that you are very welcome to, uh, to ask a question. Please use the code hashtag 375-8905. I was trying to work out in my head if there is a word that corresponds with those numbers. I haven't, I haven't managed, <laughs> but I'll just say the number one more time. Hashtag 375-8905. So I will turn to questions um, at about quarter past. So get your questions ready. But before we do that, um, I wanted to, um, Andy, just ask you probably two sides of the same coin kind of question, which is, you know, what does success in terms of leveling up look like? And I think you've given a, an inkling of it. It's a national economic plan. And what are your worries if it fails? Right. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So, so the, um, on the success side, uh, I mean, at a sort of um, slightly, uh, I mean, technical level, I could say that success would be making good uh, on those 12, 20, 30 missions that we set out in the leveling up white paper. You know, embracing everything from, from living standards through to education and skills and, uh, and pride and well-being and agency and all that good stuff, OK? I'd be a slightly nerdy answer, but I am a slightly nerdy bloke. Uh, what do you expect? Um, my less nerdy answer, actually, which really comes from the time I spent pre-COVID um, wandering around the UK, particularly wandering around some of the less well-performing parts of the UK, um, one thing that struck me, and this is more a sort of anthropological or sociological observation than an economic one, and I make no apologies for that, by the way. That was the point of wandering around. Uh, yeah, what distinguishes places doing well and places doing badly? Of course, lots of things in a, you know, education, skills, all that stuff. Of course, of course. But actually, um, the really striking thing, the difference, was in the stories that people in those places told about their place. It was, it was, it was a narrative difference, really. And those places that were doing well, and there are plenty of places doing well right across the UK, uh, their story uh, was rooted in heritage, but wasn't being held hostage by heritage. So their stories about their place uh, were looking forwards and upwards, right? They had a story about their place, a narrative about their place that was futuristic and uplifting. And the flip of that was in places that were not doing well. Uh, their stories tended to be looking backwards and slightly downwards uh, to the floor. So success for me would be every part of the UK not only having a story about themselves rooted in their past, rooted in heritage, but in a way that enables them to look forward and to have an uplifting story about their, their future. So. Case in point, I was up in uh, Sunderland, which is the place I was born, mm -hmm. uh, two months ago. Sunderland's a place that, you know, almost a poster child of what is needed to level up a place. It's been in decline economically, socially, throughout my life, actually before my life, um, uh, before I was born. Um, but up there two months ago, something was stirring. Uh, and what was stirring ultimately is, is the people I spoke to, the local leaders, had begun to construct a story about themselves that was looking forwards uh, and upwards. And that gave me real confidence uh, that that was then a place that would be heading forwards and upwards in future. This is a slightly sidebar comment. Um, I've got this hypothesis. Maybe someone in the room can test it for me. Uh, it may well be rubbish. But as I migrated from working at the Bank of England on the east end of uh, London to, to the RSA in the west end, my whole hypothesis was that as you move, even that short distance, people's angle of gaze rises as you move from east to west. So in the city, Catherine, so if you can attest to this, I see people marching around in the city, basically, um, trying to avert the gaze of everyone, uh, <laughs> getting there as quickly as possible. 
Whereas now in the West, you know, uh, in the West End, um, people are, I mean, they look at you sometimes and uh, <laughs> occasionally even smile. Um, and uh, I think that is emblematic of something deep psychological. I'm not sure <coughs> what. And of course, the hypothesis is totally unproven. Right? I'm just making it, made it up. But there's something important about that when it comes to placemaking. I think success is about our angle of gaze and stories. Mm, that is so interesting. Um, what are you worried about? If oh, yes, I must have missed that. How, didn't I? You did. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think this is an agenda that we can't afford not to make good on. Uh, that's what I really think. You know, I, I don't see where, you know, putting it very candidly, I don't see where growth comes from in the UK if it's not from here. Um, you know, I, I, we are bumping up. The reason we've got a cost of living crisis is because we're bumping up some very hard and sharp, a bunch of reasons, of course. But we're, bunch, we're bumping up against some very hard and sharp supply-side constraints. Shortage of people, shortage of skills. Um, and unless and until we address those, um, I can't think that we will unlock growth and thrive. It's not all about growth. But to your point from earlier on, Linda, uh, the inequalities um, stretch the social fabric to breaking point if the pie is not growing. So we need to do, you know, the, the nice thing I think about the leveling up agenda is that it is an expansion of the pie in a way that also leads to a more equal slicing of it. Yeah. And hands up who's against that right now. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, so I'm going to take a question uh, from Jane uh, Long, who has um, gotten uh, gotten in first, and then, <laughs> and then um, the microphone is coming to you. And then you all know the drill. And just a reminder to the online audience, I have Slido, so please do post a question using that code. But Jane. You're Thank on. you. Um, you. You've talked about the people and places, so and about the balance of people and places. So in, in the context of the people, We've heard a lot this morning around um, the impact of poverty in London and um, of you know, the high, you know, highest levels of, of universal credit, et cetera, and child poverty. So in the context of that, what do you believe we as housing associations can do to ensure that the voices of our residents um, that we hear you know, all frequently in terms of their circumstance are heard um, to influence policy and to influence levelling up that moves forward? Yeah, thank you, uh, Jane. Um, uh, and that too is a um, uh, a great question. I mean, is you 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 run a housing association currently? Yes, I work at um, MTBH. Yeah, um, I would say you you and others in a leadership role. Um, I would hope there would be means. You know, I'm sure there are means of you um, coalescing your views um, from your tenants and beyond. Uh, and I hope and actually expect that uh, it'd be de luck as the department most relevant, I think, to, to um, would be willing recipients uh, of those uh, of those views. Uh, I, I, I can't speak for them. They should speak for themselves. I know the issues you mention. Uh, one, we're very front and center in our leveling up discussions. And two, are very close to the heart um, of uh, Michael Gove as Secretary of State for that department. So my hope would be that, you know, if you can bring those views together clearly, and I'm sure compellingly as you just have, uh, that you get a, a more than fair hearing on, the, on that front. And you, as you probably know, I mean, there are moves afoot uh, on the housing market to put in a different place than it, it has been. And there's a hugely, there's a hugely overdue, I, I you know, I mean, our housing market, to have got into this, I mean, a lot, along every dimension is, is I find, incredible. Uh, I am of the view, you know, that, that decent housing is pretty much a human right, and to be not making good on that is, is therefore totally unacceptable. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I've got tons of questions and tons of questions, so I'm going to try to get through as many as I can. I needn't have worried, by the way, about the code. I mean, Clearly, people are very, very tech savvy. So thank you for all the questions that have come in. Um, so this question, uh, which got the most votes, um, it comes from Kat Hanna. What are examples, Andy, of successful leveling up supported by private sector 
investment. Yeah, I think we see um, I think we see a number of those uh, in parts of North America, which we have studied uh, really extensively. I, I think you see parts of that uh, across Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and to be clear, um, this is not leave it to free market. To be clear, don't misinterpret my comments as government gets out of way, leave the space for private sector. That, that is not remotely where I am. Um, my reading of international case law on successful leveling up, and, and to be clear, um, there have been more examples of unsuccessful leveling up than successful leveling up, but there are still enough successful examples. And this is also true, of course, uh, not also true of the UK's history when it comes to leveling up, is that the secret recipe for success comes from uh, combining the efforts of central government, local government, uh, private enterprise, um, uh, local civil society, uh, and local educational institutions of various types. So when I, you know, so up in Manchester uh, two weeks ago, um, you know, not everything in Manchester is perfect, but they have found a means of enabling that conversation and plan among those moving parts central government, local government, uh, local NHS, transport, education, business, uh, civil society. And, and that, for me, is the, the mix that's needed. And when I look elsewhere around the world for success, that's what it's been built uh, upon. And yeah, that's the recipe I'd, When I spoke, there's 375 pages, which I can summarize in a single sentence, which is a new model of governance. And that new model of governance is that local coalition of public, private, and third delivering a local plan. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's what success looks like internationally, domestically in the past, and definitely domestically in the future. Thank you. I'm practicing my own leveling up to get geographical diversity in the room. <laughs> so I'm headed, I'm headed this way next, and then I'm going to head that way. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate what you're saying about the pie getting bigger, which we're all in favour of. Um, I'm a chief exec of an organisation that's got London in the title, uh, London Sport, and I'm sure many others have around here. Um, but there have been practical cases where funding has been diverted. So there was a DCMS Arts Fund, which was explicitly not then able for people from London to apply for. I know of a national sports organisation that used to have a grant fund just for London, it's now decided that has to be nationwide, and I'm sure we can debate the merits of that or not, but can you give us a bit more comfort, I think, for some of us in the audience, that funding will not be diverted as a result of the levelling up agenda? So I might not be able to, I might give you an answer that you're not going to like very much, uh, but why wouldn't I be honest and candid about it? Um, so I'm going to be. Um, so there is, uh, I mean, as, as part of this levelling up agenda, part of it was asking the question of every government department, what is your contribution to, to levelling up or not? Um, when you asked uh, lots of departments that question, what came back was quite interesting. <laughs> um, several said they didn't actually know. Um, they, didn't ex they couldn't exactly tell you where they were spending their money around, which is quite revealing. And of course, that needs fixing because if you're acting place blind, who knows whether you're helping or hindering on the leveling up um, objective. For some, uh, we know for some departmental spending budgets though, there has historically been quite a, a strong tilt towards London and the Southeast. Um, and arts and culture spending would be one of those. No secret in that, the numbers are clear for, for that. Um, the same would be true to an extent uh, of R&D spending. The same would be true to an extent of transport spending. The same would be true to an extent uh, of housing spending. As before, not the only ones, but significant ones. Um, and some retilting is now underway. Now, my hope would be, and you tell me whether this is not being made good on, that this wouldn't be redirecting loads of money away from local projects, local serving local communities with people who aren't um, well off or have huge access to alternative means of arts and culture in your case. That would definitely be the wrong way to go. 
And that goes to my hyperlocal point from earlier on, I think. It, it, it depends on the local practical application. And if that was making a bad situation worse uh, in places in London that were really in need, that would be a concern for me. I'm going to go to uh, the next question uh, on Slido. I'm alternating, um, and then I'll come to the gentleman uh, there. The mic can move there after this question. Um, I'm going to alternate into Slido because um, Andy, I believe, will be around for the reception after the. Um, I've just now committed you to the reception Very good. <laughs> at 10:30, <laughs> so there'll be a chance for those in the room to have a to have a chat with him um, as well. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to get through everyone's questions. Um, this one that's come in uh, on Slido. Um, coming from Deborah, again, uh, lots of votes. London's leveling up challenges and the needs of Londoners are often met with skepticism from people elsewhere in the UK. How do we change those attitudes? So I think um, having some of the conversation we're having in this room would, 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 would really help. I, I don't know, as I say, that so far um, the comms around this have put their best foot forward. Uh, I do think there's a huge amount that uh, the London experience can teach the rest of the country about how success feels and how success best works, including on devolution, whether well there's ahead, well ahead of the, the pack elsewhere. So I think one thing would be looking for means of spreading not the money in this case, but the expertise that's been gathered here London is a massive, massive success story. There absolutely is unfinished business. I totally accept that. But there's lots of part of London that have been transformed relative to where they were 30 or 40 years ago. Um, that's, again, in nerd speak, agglomeration made real. The benefits of following the right recipe, combining all the core ingredients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, else, elsewhere around the country, they don't want to be London, but that doesn't mean they can't follow the London recipe in baking their own cake. And I think there's a huge amount that the London experience and you in this room could do to you know, promulgate that recipe, which has worked overall you know, fantastically well for, for large parts of London. Thank you. Question there. Uh, thank you. Um, I've worked in central government and I work in local government and it's heartening to hear what you say about kind of the the emphasis on police-based policy, um, you know, that, that's that's great. And uh, and we've also heard talk about um, poverty and the child poverty in London. And if you look at poverty, obviously there are two determinants out there. There's income and there's wealth. Um, and if you look at wealth, one of the biggest drivers of that kind of um, poverty is, or, or the, the, the unequal distribution of the wealth is home ownership. Um, and in London and in many places in the South East, you know, people are any more from the rise in their house price every year than they are from the money, the income that they're getting. So my question really is, uh, we've touched on the housing market. Um, given that one of the other priorities the government's got as well as leveling up is home ownership, um, I know there's political and economic reasons for that, but I'd be interested in, you may want to touch on the politics, but I'd be interested in what you think the should be done from an economic point of view with regards to the inequality from home ownership and, and, and the distortion of the market because people use their house as an investment. Yeah, thank you. I missed your name as well, sorry. It's David Francis. David, David, thank you. Um, so on, um, on, on, on all matters, I'll try and speak in the mic. Um, on all matters housing, I mean, I would draw a, um, a sharp distinction between um, everyone, and I do mean everyone, having access uh, to decent quality housing, which, as I say, I see as being an absolutely base layer uh, of any well-performing society, which we're not making good on right now, uh, from the questions of, of tenure, of, of, of ownership. Uh, I don't have strongly held views on the tenure uh, question. I mean, I really don't. Uh, personally, I would, not, uh, I would not have had home ownership as among the objectives of leveling up, it confuses the base layer that's really important and the tenure question, which is far less important uh, from, my, uh, from my perspective. I, mean, I think the focus for me uh, would be on having 
um, a, uh, a rental sector that is much more effective um, in terms of its quality and pricing and access than is the case uh, currently. When I see parts of the UK, including parts of London, that are performing least well, I need to look no further uh, than the quality of their housing stock and the rental market in particular to see why that is the case. So um, I might strike a slightly different chord than what you might hear from um, the machines over there, because for me it's all about uh, quality and price, and it's not at all about tenure. I can give you lots of reasons why home ownership by itself might actually be counterproductive from an economic perspective. I'll save you that for uh, another day. Well, we only have a minute, so I think it will have to be saved, I'm, I'm afraid, for later on. In, um, in the final minute, Andy, can I just ask you, what advice, what exhortation, what would you like to see London organizations like Centre for London, like London Sport, what can we all go out and do to, in terms of speaking with our counterparts in other parts of the UK, to try and, you know, to really deliver the leveling up agenda. So what role can all these fantastic organizations and people who have had great questions, yeah. you know, do yeah. to, to help you? Yeah. Well, it's not a question of helping me. I think it's all a question of, uh, of us helping each other. I mean, communities are built mm -hmm. by communities. Uh, and this is a community. Um, so I think it's wonderful that we have the center because it's a means of mobilizing and coalescing the community. Um, this is a conversation that, that should be happening uh, in a wide group of people, because everyone's got a stake uh, in their local area. That's what gives them agency, and, that's what, and they have the information on what needs doing. We've said the map is hyper-local. You need hyper-local information to, to tackle those problems, and that hyper-local information is held in people, including some of the people in this, um, some of the people in this in this room. So, um, whether it's through the RSA or the Centre for London, uh, I would love, you know, um, more of these deliberative, participatory fora, at which we can get to the bottom of what this is all about, uh, decide how best we can ourselves make a contribution, and then get on and making it. Because ultimately, success here, to end where I started, will come from us, not from what's happening over there. Mm. That is actually a great um, note um, to end on. I, I'm not going to sum up, but I think my, my takeaway, and this is actually rooted in more economic research, so bear with me, because obviously you've got two economists here <laughs> on the platform, which is in places where leveling up has been successful, it is actually the people their education, their skills, their training, their agency, that's actually made the difference. Their ability to organize their communities. So we think sometimes too much about investing in physical capital, but it's actually the human capital that needs to be mobilized. And you know, I think that's come out really clearly um, today, which is fantastic to hear. And that goes to Andy's very non-economist, but um, compelling point around the narrative, because when people see the economy doing well, but they're not, it doesn't matter, there's a disconnect. So if they have agency and they're doing better, the narrative they tell about themselves, that's what changes. So it's not about aggregate growth, it's about equality. And you know, I think um, I'm very hopeful that we actually do have a national economic plan, that great think tanks like Central for London, like King's College working on these issues, like other organizations, are all pulling together um, to make this a much better um, growth and society uh, story for us by 2030. And 2030 is around the corner. This is not like John Maynard Art Keynes. In the long run, we're all dead. And that's when things will be better. <laughs> this is within um, our grasp. So can you please join me um, in thanking Andy Haldane for just a terrific session and giving us hope about leveling up. <laughs>
so much, everyone. I'm, I'm afraid you now get me doing jazz hands again until I get the thumbs up, but I can invite um, Nick up to the podium to give some closing remarks. Um, fortunately, the vote seems to be against me doing the levelling up dance, but it does seem like I need to buy a tractor or possibly one of those old-fashioned um, surveying devices, a philodolite. Um, to try to measure the angles of people's gazes. We'll get on to that after this session. Um, but for now, my pleasure to introduce Nick Bowes, Chief Executive of Centre for London, who's going to wrap up for today. Nick. Thank you, Claire. And thank you to Claire for being a fantastic uh, MC today. Um, I'm going to keep my closing remarks very short uh, after what was a fantastic discussion, because I'm standing between... Uh, colleagues and some more coffee. Um, uh, uh, and who better to do some closing remarks than an economic geographer? I did a PhD over 20 years ago on levelling up, before it was called levelling up, um, and a northerner. And I can turn up my Yorkshireness when I need to, so uh, uh, as many of my colleagues at Centre for London know. Um, so I just want to make a few thank yous to uh, people today. First of all, can I thank Kings for being a fantastic host? Uh, and giving us this fantastic space. I notice it's actually raining now, but you can go out on the terrace and there's a really great view. Hopefully it'll stop in time. Um, can I uh, also uh, thank uh, the uh, supporters of this project, uh, City Bridge Trust, Trust for London, Greater London Authority, the University, uh, the London Councils, City of London Corporation, Central London Forward, P15 Housing Associations, South London Partnership, and the London boroughs of Enfield, Brent, and Hounslow. I think I've ticked them all off there. Apologies if I haven't. Um, and just a couple of uh, adverts for future events coming up. On the 13th of September, we're hosting a webinar on levelling up shared challenges for UK cities, where we'll be bringing together city leaders uh, for a conversation on our shared challenges on levelling up. And also, thinking even further beyond that, a date for diaries, the 1st of November will be the London Conference and will be at Senate House this year, so please put that in diaries now. And it was really uh, interesting that uh, Andy mentioned uh, local government pension schemes because we've got a couple of projects later in the year which might be of interest on uh, lo local government pension schemes and also on impact investments. So uh, there's a couple to look out for there. Um, can I also just finally um, thank... Uh, Centre for London and King's colleagues for putting on a great event today and I hope that you'll hang around for a bit more food and drink uh, and some more chat. So thank you everybody.